So welcome everyone. Uh, the speaker today um, is Paul Buran, my colleague at ETH, and the title, and he's going to tell us about triangulated persistence categories and their K theory. Okay. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, so, like I said earlier, before we started, uh, I feel a bit of an outsider in this forum because I, I don't do not really work in uh, applied topology. So uh, just feel free to to uh, uh, stop me if I talk about things that are too well known or or vice versa, if they are, uh, they look, uh, uh, it looks that like I'm going over them too quickly, just, so I just don't know exactly the background. So anyway, uh, this is a, a joint work with Octave Cornea and uh, Jun Zhang, and it's gonna be mostly a formal talk, an algebraic talk in which we will try to create a marriage between two concepts. One of them is triangulated categories, and the other one is uh, persistence structures. So these are called this uh, so-called TPC, uh, triangulated persistence uh, uh, categories. And let me, for some reason, I cannot erase uh, what I did here, but anyway. So what is a persistence category? Uh, well, this is exactly what you would expect it to be. There's, there are no surprises here. It's just a category. And for every two objects, the home uh, of the two objects is a persistence model. I will work over a field. So the persistence models will be over fields. And there are a certain uh, uh, assumptions that you put here, the identity uh, elements in home XX are in persistence level zero, as you see here. And also the composition is, is compatible with a persistence structure in, in the obvious sense. Uh, I mean, that's a kind of a natural condition here. Um, and also the levels add up. So when you compose a morphism from level S with a morphism of level R, you land in level R plus S, as you see here, right? And, um, once you have a, a PC, a persistence category, uh, there are two sub, uh, there are two categories associated to it immediately. One of them I call C0, and the other one is called C infinity. So C0 is just, uh, you just go and take persistence level zero. And because of these uh, assumptions I made earlier, um, this is really a category. When you compose things, you land uh, inside the same homes. So this is called the C0 category, and there is the C infinity category, which uh, just take the uh, direct limit over S, S is the persistence parameter, uh, going to infinity, and you see what survives when you go to infinity in the persistence level, and this is called C infinity. And these are categories uh, uh, for obvious reasons, I mean, for formal reasons. Now there is a concept called shift functor, which might look slightly confusing, but it's really nothing very complicated. So this is not a functor, this is a, a family of functors, one for every real number R here. And you know, they compose if you compose the shift R with the shift S, you get shift R plus S. And basically the idea is that when you shift an object the home at persistence level uh, S get shifted by the amount of the shift the functor gave you. So um, formally speaking, these functors, they come with some natural isomorphisms between the functor number S and the functor number R. And these things shift persistent, persistence level by R minus S. So I try to kind of be more down to earth what's going on here. So. You see, if you look at home at level alpha minus R of the shifted object sigma R of X, comma Y, this is the same thing. It's isomorphic to the home at level alpha of X, comma Y without shift. Okay, so this is all you try to do here. But of course, uh, on a categorical level, you need to assume that you have such a functor. It doesn't come for granted. And, um, Another thing here is that you can always take this uh, kind of natural isomorphism between the shift of, of X by R units to X and compose it with the persistent structural 
uh, maps, right? The one that go from level, say, minus R to level zero. And then what you get is not an isomorphism, you just get a map. And that's an important map that I'm going to call a morphism, eta xr, and this is in home zero between the shifted object and the object itself. Now, this, this may look very confusing, but let me give you an example that you all know and where you can see the structures uh, in a very down to earth uh, way. So I'm going to look at uh, the homotopy category of filtered chain complexes. So I'm talking here about uh, the objects are just chain complexes. For simplicity, I'm going to assume that they are over a field and finally generated. So these are chain complexes, and there is an increasing filtration um, parameterized by the real numbers, by sub, by sub chain complexes. And now uh, H0 filtered chain is just a homotopy category of filtered chain complexes. So what is the persistence level R between home of A and B? Chain maps between A and B that move filtration level alpha to filtration level alpha plus R for every alpha. And because it's a homotopy category, I identify uh, chain maps, if they are chain homotopic, by a chain homotopy that shifts filtration by the same amount. So in other words, F becomes equivalent to G if there is a, a chain homotopy, H that shifts filtration by exactly the same amount, and F minus G is uh, HD plus DH, okay? And what is the shift factor? Well, you take the chain complex and just shift the filtration on it. And what is this uh, strange morphism? Eta R is just the inclusion between uh, you know, the chain complex at level alpha minus R and the chain complex at level alpha, just the inclusion. So of course, this is not an isomorphism anymore. But, but, uh, and of course, this exists only if R is positive, right? Uh, OK, so these are kind of very basic uh, structures. Let's see. And here is an important definition. I'm going to call an object of my persistence category R a cyclic. If this morphism, that, you know, the, like the one that looked like the inclusion, if this eta R is actually zero, this is this turns out to be equivalent to the requirement that if you take the identity morphism on A and push it by the persistence. Uh, structural maps are units further uh, uh, forward, you get zero. Okay, so this is called an uh, R acyclic object. And uh, yeah, so of course, the, the inspiration to the name comes from acyclic chain complexes. Right, so now we, we come to the main definition what is a TPC, uh, uh, triangulated persistence particular? So this is, first of all, a, a persistence category. And uh, it should satisfy exactly three conditions. First of all, when you look at C0, the zero level uh, uh, category that I defined earlier, this is a triangulated category like in the classical sense. So it's a triangulated category. Uh, in particular, it comes with a class of uh, distinguished or exact, sometimes they are called triangles. So these are these diagrams here that satisfy a, a long list of axioms uh, that are classical in, in algebra and topology. And this T that you see here is a new, a new letter. Uh, this is the translation factor. So in a triangulated category of a translation factor, right? Which is basically like shifting degree. And I have a problem because I have also a shift factor uh, and they have not, nothing to do one with the, the other. So shift factor has to do with uh, shifting the persistence level. Translation factor is with translating the degree, but in the literature, sometimes on triangulated category, you will see uh, that the translation factor is called shift factor. So for us, these are completely different things. So uh, con the second condition, I need uh, that C is ended with the shift functor and the shift functor is triangulated. So it 
sends uh, distinguished triangles to distinguished triangles, and it also commutes with a translation factor. Okay, not a, a very restrictive condition. It's, it, it makes sense to, to require it. And C, and that's important. So if you take this uh, eta R map, the one from the shifted object to the object itself, then this can be completed into an exact triangle uh, whose uh, object in the middle, K, is R cyclic. So that's an assumption. So you see this uh, K, you can think of it like the mapping cone of the map eta R. And eta R is not quite an isomorphism. It's, a, it's like an isomorphism if you forget about filtrations. But if you keep filtrations, uh, uh, if you take them into account, you're gonna get, uh, you know, in the homotopy category of chain complexes, you're gonna get a chain complex, uh, which is acyclic, but it requires, to, you know, to kind of, uh, to, to make a cha chain homotopy equivalent to zero, it requires a shift in the persistence of R. And this is what is here, K is R cyclic. So these are the conditions of a TPC, and they may look weird at the beginning. Uh, so why did we choose these ones and not other ones? So I, what I will try in the talk to show you what this can buy for you and buy you and what kind of measurements you can do with such a structure and where it appears. So first of all, a few examples. So um, of course the, the homotopy category of filter chain complexes is a TPC. The reason is the following, that uh, on filter chain complexes, you have a mapping cone construction. And once you go to the homotopy category, um, you, you get a triangulated category. This is well known. And the other axioms, you know, the axiom B and C uh, are easy to check. Then there is a, the example that actually is, is why I got interested in all this, because I really don't come from algebraic topology or from algebra, so I work in symplectic topology, and there there is something called the derived Fukaya category of a symplectic manifold. And this category is a triangulated category that was invented by uh, Fukaya and Konsevich and other researchers, played a serious role in so-called mirror symmetry and all sort of such directions of research. But we discovered that uh, it can be enhanced to become a TPC. So this is an example from a different direction. And last thing I want to say is that if you have a TPC, always you can associate with another TPC, which is, I'm going to denote it AC. And this is just the full subcategory of R cyclic objects where R is any real number bigger or equal than zero. So, for example, if you take the homotopy category of filtered acyclic chain complexes, it's also a TPC. And this, this follows from you know, general, uh, from, um, from the axioms uh, without too much work. Right. So here's the first thing that you can do when you have a TPC. You can look at so-called weighted triangles. So, uh, First of all, uh, a little definition. So we, we need the notion of something which is called an R isomorphism. So suppose I have uh, two objects A and B, and I'm looking here at a map persistence level zero. I call it an R isomorphism if, so non-formally speaking, the mapping cone of F is R cyclic. So, Formally speaking, if there is a distinguished triangle, A, this one, A to B with the map F, and then to some R cyclic object, K. Okay. This thing is called an R isomorphism, and R isomorphisms are not isomorphisms. They are almost isomorphisms. In, in, in what sense? So here's this remark. If, if you have an R isomorphism, it has so-called R inverses, so it has uh, uh, a left and a right are inverse, this phi and psi that you see here. 
Uh, this means that when you compose with phi, you get, well, not the identity map, but exactly this uh, inclusion type of map, eta r. And the same thing when you compose f with a psi from the left. So these r inverses are not unique, but uh, uh, they exist, one can prove this. And now we come to the notion of an exact triangle of weight r. So just to warn you, an exact triangle of weight R is not an exact triangle at all. It would like to be, but it's not. So the definition is as follows. So the shape of the diagram looks like this. A goes to B, goes to C, and then you shift R units backward TA. T is the translation of A. So the diagram looks like this. And the diagram should be in C0. And I call such a diagram an exact triangle of weight R, if there is a genuine distinguished or exact triangle in C0, so uh, this one. So here the objects are A, B, and C prime. So this C is replaced by C prime. And basically the genuine triangle and the one of weight R are R isomorphic one to the other. So formally speaking, what you, you have here is that, you know, you take the genuine exact triangle, and then on top, you have the left and right inverses, uh, left and right inverses, uh, one of the other maps phi and psi, which identify C prime with C by R isomorphisms. And then you get the original triangle by, you know, composing with these maps. So uh, up to R isomorphisms, I think this is the best way to think about it. The triangle is distinguished. So of course, uh, a genuinely uh, distinguished triangle is of weight zero. So here's a theorem. It's a, it's a formal theorem. It's nothing very special here. Um, it's very general. Uh, so you see, if you take C0 and you take the acyclics in, in C0, uh, which is a triangulated subcategory, then there is a general construction in category theory called the Verdier localization, which, which appears uh, in triangulated categories. Uh, if you do this localization, you get the category C infinity. So C infinity is really uh, equivalent uh, to this category. And another thing that is well known that the localization will give you a new triangulated category. So what is interesting is that this infinity is triangulated as well. And of course, uh, when you look at this description, it might be not so obvious to guess how the exact triangles in C infinity look like. But if you kind of unwrap it, you see that the distinguished triangles in C infinity are basically images of weighted triangles uh, in C. So images under this direct limit. So, um, so you get a triangulated structure on C infinity. So let me quickly say something about K theory. So of course, uh, if you have all these triangulated categories, you have the Grothendieck group. So I'm gonna say very classical things about it. I'm not a specialist in K-theory. Uh, just to remind uh, so that we are all on the same page, if you have a triangulated category, uh, you can associate to it the K group or the Golden D group. Usually it's written K zero of D. So this is a, a quotient of a free group by some relation group, subgroup. What is a free group? You take the free group, a free abelian group on the objects of, of the category and the relations are as follows. Each time you have a distinguished triangle in your category, you put a relation that looks X minus Y plus Z equals zero. You collect all these relations, you get a subgroup, you quotient by it and you get uh, the Gotten D group. And you know, this kind of plays a role in, in this theory. And just what happens in our case? So in our case, I need to introduce here a ring that everybody know, but in each field of research, it's, it's called by a different name. 
So in symplectic topology, this is called the ring of Novikov polynomials. I'm sure that in other areas of research, it has a different name. So these are just formal polynomials, not polynomials, formal uh, things that look like that, where it is a formal variable. The coefficients mi are integers in my case, and the powers lambda i are real numbers. And you, you are doing only a finite sum here. This has a completion. There is a, a ring of Novikov series also, where you can take infinite sums, but then you have to make sure that the lambda i's never accumulate. So they, when you go to infinity, they also go to infinity. And the first uh, thing to observe here is that all the k groups, all the k groups that you have here, if you have a TPC, if you look at K of C0, you get a lambda P module where the action is, is, is quite uh, easy to describe. Uh, the formal va variable T to the power R acts on a K class X by shifting the object X R units and taking the K class. So you see it here. Okay. Um, well, these things fit into a, an exact sequence, which is not really short exact sequence. It's not injective from the left in general. <clears throat> so K of the acyclics maps to K of C0, and this rejects on K of C infinity. And you know the map, uh, the last map here, this one, uh, it can be, uh, I mean, all, all these maps are, are induced by the, you know, an object goes to itself, but in, in the other group. But uh, these, these are really maps of lambda P modules. And if you wonder how come K of C infinity is a lambda P module, because this is not a persistence category anymore. Well, it has kind of a, an obvious, a bit forgetful uh, lambda p module structure. So a polynomial q of t acts on a k class by just setting the variable t to be one. And then, then you just uh, get an, a lambda p module structure. So this k theory is very much related to barcodes. Uh, so suppose you have a, a, a persistence module n and B of N is uh, the barcode. So I work with a convention in which my barcodes are, they look like this. Uh, they are closed from the left and open from the right, the intervals in the, the bars. And MK are the multiplicities. Then I can define a Novico uh, polynomial from the barcode. Each time I see an interval AK comma BK, I take T to the power AK minus T to the power BK. And I use a multiplicity as coefficient, as you see here. And if the bar is infinite, so if, if uh, BK is infinity, I just, uh, T to the infinity, I set to be zero. Now, if I, if I have a graded persistence module, so this means just uh, you know, a sequence of, of uh, persistence modules, uh, each of them indexed, uh, so the index by, by the integers, then I can take an alternating sum of the previous polynomials I described, and this is called lambda of M uh, as described here, I get a Novikov polynomial. And the general theorem you can prove about these things is that there is a pairing between uh, K of C0 and K of C0, only that the first K you have to take with the opposite lambda p module structure. The pairing has values in Novikov polynomials. And the pairing is just the following. You take two uh, k classes. You represent them by objects, x and y. So it's easy to prove that every k class can be represented also by a, uh, really by an object. And now you just take the homes in your category between x and all the translates of y and you take the, you know, this, this thing that I cooked from the barcode of this. And the theorem here is that this is well-defined on K classes, not just on objects. So what, what's written here, you can always do. The theorem says that uh, this descends to K theory. 
And this is basically a generalization, a persistent generalization of Euler characteristic, if you like. It keeps, it kind of calculates some kind of Euler characteristic below every persistence level. So this is what you get in the example of, of uh, the homotopy category of filter chain complexes. So the C0 category, the K group is the ring of Novikov polynomials. The unit is just represented by the chain complex of rank one concentrated in degree zero and filtration level zero. The cyclics, uh, they have the K, the Grotten D group is just all the Novikov polynomials such that when you plug T equals one, you get zero. And the last one is not surprising, right? K of C infinity. So C infinity is like, you know, it's a category where you have filtered uh, chain complexes as objects, but you forget about the filtration. So each of them is filtered, but every if you have the same chain complex with two different filtrations, they are isomorphic. So obviously K is going to be Z, right? Because the Euler characteristic will give you the isomorphism. So this is K theory. So there is some, some kind of measurements you can do with theory and now I, I get maybe to the thing that is at least for us was the main motivation to look at this and it's called the fragmentation matrix so that's a general question that you can ask um, you have a TPC and you have an object and uh, usually in triangulated categories you try to to decompose every object as an iterated cone or an iterated uh, sequence of triang uh, distinguished triangles with some kind of simple set of objects that are called the generators of your category. So an iterated cone decomposition, so this is kind of something that appears in, in, in topology usually, uh, of X is just a sequence of distinguished triangles. So how should you think about it? You start with object zero, you attach to it the object X1 and the mapping cone is Y1. Then you take Y1, attach to it X2 and the mapping cone is Y2. And you continue to attach objects, the objects that you attach are X1, X2 until Xn, until you get an object, uh, oop, sorry, uh, an object Yn, which is your X. So, the only thing is that I'm faking here. These are not exact distinguished triangles. These are weighted triangles. So this concept is well known in topology. If, if these are, you, you have no R1, R2 until Rn. If this were honest to go distinguished triangles, this would be an iterated con decomposition. But in a TPC, uh, this is what you might want to try. And then this iterated con decomposition has a total weight. You sum the weights of the distinguished triangles you encountered in this decomposition. I'm also uh, denoted by L of D, the linearization of, the, of this iterated con decomposition. These are just the objects that you attach, x1 until x1. So, so you see that this thing comes with a measurement. And now uh, that's again, uh, something very general and follows from axioms that this weight behaves additively with respect to cone refinements. So, you know, if you decompose X uh, using the objects X1 until Xn, and then you pick one of them, say Xi, and decompose it with some objects, say A1 until AK, then uh, you can write a longer, on the composition of X, where instead of XI, you plug in, okay, the translations of the A objects. And the weights just add up. And the proof of this uses something that I didn't go to. This is called the weighted octahedral uh, property that TPCs have. This is a, a, a TPC analog of the octahedral axiom in triangulated categories. Um, right. So now, once you have these weights, you can ask the following question. 
which originated really in symplectic topology in some geometric context. You fix a set of objects which you think of as generators of your category. And so this F is like an auxiliary fixed collection of objects. And now you take two objects and you want to know how hard it is to get X uh, by starting with X prime and doing iterated cone decompositions, but only by attaching things from F. So the definition is this measurement. Delta F X X prime is the infimum of the total weight of an iterated cone decomposition with linearization having objects from F. Somewhere in the middle, you can put, for formal reasons, I need to translate X prime, and then again, objects from F. You are allowed not to use objects from F, but you, you are, but you can use them if you want. So this is the infimum. So you get some number, some real number, and uh, it satisfies the triangle inequality. This, and this has to do exactly with this subadditivity of the weight that I showed earlier. This one. So this thing, there are, there are too many markers on the screen. So let me erase the ones that. So what you see here implies basically this, this inequality. Now this quantity is not symmetric. So you symmetrize it. Uh, so you take the maximum of delta F X X prime and delta F X prime X. And what you get is a pseudometric on the objects of the category. So it's pseudometric because it might vanish. So you see, in your category, you might have two objects that are different objects, and they are isomorphic without what we call zero isomorphic. Then you can uh, get one from the other without attaching anything, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, and you get zero. So this is all right. I mean, uh, you know, when you talk about metrics on, on the objects of the category, this definitely might vanish. Now this thing might also get the value infinity on some pairs of objects, just because it could be that your set F is not rich enough to generate any X prime from any X. So this is also possible. So I know that in, uh, in um, uh, persistence theory, there is uh, the interleaving uh, distance. So of course you can define it here as well. So this is a categorical uh, version of the interleaving distance, right? You have two objects, take the infimum of R such that, you know, uh, you have a map from the shift of X by R to Y and one uh, in the other direction that compose to these inclusions. So this is the interleaving distance. And of course, uh, it makes sense to also define the, shift invariant versions of, of these metrics, where you just, you know, uh, instead of taking X and Y, you allow also to shift Y and take the infimum between the distances as written. And this metric that I showed you, the fragmentation metric is definitely in the easiest case, very much related to the interleaving. So if you take the family F to be the empty set, so you are not allowed to attach um, uh, any objects except of the zero object. Then uh, the measurement I showed before is bounded between the interleaving and four times the interleaving. It's just a matter of some normalizations that give you this four. Um, okay, that's not how to prove. I do not know the precise relation if F is a different set of objects. It might be more complicated. Uh, but that's definitely a question that would be nice to know. Now, what is the upshot of all this is written here. The upshot of all this is that if you have a triangulated category, not persistence, that has a TPC refinement. So what do I mean by this? I mean that there is a TPC whose infinity category turns out to be D. If this is the case, then you can do measurements on D by basically you know doing the measurements on the refinement and infamizing over representatives 
And this leads to also of calculations uh, on categories where you cannot do these calculations. You need a refinement. And the, what I want to do now is uh, the last part of the talk. I, I want to show you my own motivation of why I uh, got interested in all this. And so, so I'll be very quick here. And this is something in symplectic geometry, but so in symplectic geometry, we have something called the Fukai category. So basically we're looking at uh, symplectic manifolds X and the symplectic structure in the simplest situation is an exact uh, structure. So it is D of a one form. And the assumption is that the manifold looks nicely at infinity. So no technical problems with infinity. And then there is a, a category called the Fukaya category of X. Now this is not a category, it's an infinity category. So um, it's not the Honus category. And the objects of it are what we call exact Lagrangian submanifolds of, uh, of X, L. And then you have the home between two objects. This is called the Floer chain complex between every two Lagrangian submanifolds. Now, as it happens, this comes with a natural filtration function. So the generators of this chain complex, uh, each of them gets a real value by something which is called the action functional, and which I will not describe here. It's, it's, it's too much for the time I have. Um, and therefore, this is a filter chain complex. The differential respects this filtration. So you see, it's not so much of a choice like you do in Morse theory that you just you have a manifold and you take a Morse function. This, you know, this action uh, functional comes is kind of uniquely defined and it comes uh, in advance. You, you want to study it. You don't want to study other functionals. And the point is that this uh, and now this uh, Foucault category can can be enhanced to a triangulated category called the derived category. The homes now become floor homologies. And you can get persistence floor homologies using this filtration. And the point is that this has a natural TPC refinement. And this is basically the work that we did. So uh, you can do all these fragmentation measurements that I described earlier, and they have a geometric meaning uh, on the space of Lagrangian submanifolds. And I will end, I have exactly three minutes. I will try to show you that even the K theory in the case of Fuga categories uh, can detect something geometric. So this is a, a theorem that is not very hard to prove. Uh, if you take this uh, TPC refinement of the Foucault category and take the K group of it, you take two objects there, then the pairing that I showed you earlier gives you a Novikov polynomial, which is, well, it's not symmetric, but it satisfies the following uh, identity when you switch between C and C prime. And th this comes from some, some type of duality that, that exists on the Foucault category. So you have to take the variable T, change it to, to in, T inverse, and then multiply by some sign, which turns out to be minus one to the dimension of the Lagrangian. Now, if a class in K is represented by an embedded Lagrangian, then the pairing, uh, on A comma A, the self uh, pairing, turns out to be the constant Novikov polynomial with value minus one to the n times the Euler characteristic of L. So this is a kind of potential to, uh, this might detect immersed from embedded Lagrangians. And indeed, in this case, in case, this case you see a two dimensional manifold, which turns out to be a plumbing of two cylinders. The red stuff is the Lagrangians. So here uh, you see an embedded Lagrangian, Q. And what you see here is an immersed Lagrangian, S. And they are both objects of this derived Foucault category. But moreover, usual K theory will never see the difference between them just because you can take S and using the so-called exact homotopy, bring it to be Q. 
So the usual K theory will not see the difference between Q and S. However, and this is the last slide, uh, this K theory for the persistence, for the TPC, will see the difference. So if you calculate the self-pairing on the class B represented by Q, well, you get zero. All the characteristic of S1 is zero. And if you take this immersion and you calculate the self-pairing, so this is the calculation that you need to do with the flurry complexes. I will not show it here, but it's not very long. You get the following polynomial, minus t to the power minus a plus t to the a. What is a? A is actually this area that you see here. This little loon that you see here trapped between the point x and y, y double prime is taken from the paper. So this way it's called y double prime. Uh, has an area, and this area shows up in these powers here. And so, uh, yeah, the, the pairing on K-theory distinguished. So you can, this basically implies that the class C cannot be represented by any embedded Lagrangian because K of CC is not a constant polynomial. Right, um, that's it. Uh, I'm one minute over time, I think, but I hope that's okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so maybe I would ask everyone to unmute themselves so that uh, we can... Yeah, my computer is making terrible noise. I don't know why. Okay, and now it's time for questions. Um, so yeah, so feel free to unmute yourselves and ask um, or type questions into the chat window. Maybe I can I can start while we're waiting for some of the questions. Maybe a very naive one since I'm not an not an expert in symplectic topology. But um, can you can you use this to do um, uh, to do some kind of classifications potentially of of certain uh, um, of certain symplectic manifolds, for instance? Um, uh, I don't know the answer, uh, but <laughs> I will ask a, a question in the same direction. To which I also don't know the answer, but <laughs> it Wait. might be accessible. So, you know, in symplectic topology, one of the questions is uh, to find the exact isotopy classes of Lagrangians. So, mm -hmm. you, have, uh, you know, like even the following question that looks so elementary is open. You, you look at the cotangent bundle of a, of a compact manifold, then you have the zero section, that's an exact Lagrangian. Can you describe all the other exact compact Lagrangians there? So there's a Hart theorem telling you that every such exact Lagrangian is, um, well, uh, has the same cohomology, even ring, as the zero section. But is it even homotopic to the zero section? Uh, is it uh, mm -hmm. isotopic to the zero section? Is it isotopic through Lagrangians to the zero sections? open problem. <laughs> now, <Wow. laughs> yeah, yeah, there are no tools to, I mean, in dimension two, this, this is known, in dimension four, a bit is known, higher dimensions, there are no techniques to, to do this. It looks like a transcendental question, but it could be that using these techniques, you can say something about having a finite number of isotopy classes or something mm -hmm. like that. Right, just because of the metrics and how they behave. But I don't know quite how to do this, but yeah. So uh, some classification question, might, this might be related, I think. Okay, very, very Hi, interesting, exciting. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks. I think my, my question is actually just related to what you were talking about. So I was thinking precisely of the Fukaya Saido Smith Nader result. Um, yeah, of, this is the result I was mentioning. Exactly. So, like, I was thinking, in, and I mean, very heuristically, in the, in those proofs, it's you know um, matching Lagrangians locally so that you get this basis representatives. So, my question, I guess, which is naive, but I, just to try to understand how your technology could fit into that, how would you um, represent the these basis elements um, using your persistent um, 
Well, uh, you are talking I mean, probably about the left shift symbols or something like that. Yeah, say for example, yeah, if you have like left shift symbols and like what, yeah. like how, because in those, you know, you get like things that kind of match locally and then you split them up. Um, <laughs> Is that, is that kind of what you would like to do eventually? Yes, I, I, I think this is precisely. So right. uh, I think that uh, basically Foucault's Idol Smith is the following result. So you have an exact Lagrangian and you'd like very much to say something about its topology. And then there is some kind of uh, general thing that they do with left shift vibrations, expressing this Lagrangian as an iterated cone of some left shift symbols and some, I don't know, some vanishing spheres and some standard objects. The only thing is that this iterated cone is, has nothing to do with any filtrations. So if you get a filtered version of this, then I think you can uh, know much more, but uh, probably not so much about the topology of the Lagrangian, but maybe something about its distance to the zero section, for example, yeah? So, uh, you know, the space of Lagrangians has uh, this uh, famous uh, metric of the Hoffer metric, and we don't know much about it. We, we even don't know if it's bounded or not uh, in general. Oh. And, and I think that, you know, uh, our metrics, uh, which tend to be smaller, um, might be used maybe to, to show that the Hofer metric is unbounded in some situations. But I think that, yes, the Foucault Alden Smith should have a, TP, uh, a TPC version. Uh, for this, I'm sure. That's fantastic. It sounds great. Completely Thank sure. you very much for the talk, because sure. I, 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 um, I followed some of the, I guess, some of the papers of Yun Zhang as well, and the, the book by Paul Turovich. But um, mm -hmm. when I saw your papers come out, especially this second one, I thought it was really technical. So I, I really, I really benefited really? from the from the really? presentation today. Yeah. So, yeah. Um. Because I've also worked on like other. I mean, kind of unrelated. But I guess this is a second question. So there, I know there's another question, but um, this is more just speculative. But you know, one of the famous conjectures in K theory is like the um, Farrell Jones um, fiber isomorphism conjecture. So I know this is in a completely different geometric topology direction. But have you thought of of how using these filtrations for K-theory could, could be useful for other questions that are of interest to algebraic topologists, or have you had any interaction with them? So the, the answer is I, I cannot say anything intelligent in this direction, but I, I can tell you what is my complaint. My complaint is that <laughs> except of this Foucault category and all sorts of derivatives of it, and this uh, you know homotopy category of filter chain complexes, I didn't, we didn't find very many other natural examples of TPCs, uh, right? So I remember, I mean, I, I once, I think I, I, I heard it in a talk of Amnon Neyman or also in his book, he always says that triangulated categories do not reproduce. So there, there is a bunch of them and, uh, you know, it, each time a new one is discovered is a big celebration because uh, they do not reproduce. And with TPCs, uh, I don't know what is the situation. So in our paper, we, we of course, we, we described other TPCs coming more from topology, you know, like uh, general topology, but I'm not sure the topologists are very interested in them. The, the one on the derived Fukaya is definitely of interest, I think, as a TPC. And, you know, one question that one could ask is, uh, you know, there is a middle symmetry conjecture and now theorem in many cases, saying that the right Foucault is equivalent to the, to some category of, derived category of, of coherent sheaves on some algebraic, algebraic variety, the, the mirror variety. So if the derived Foucault has a TPC refinement, does the other side, the coherent sheaves, Maybe this one has a TPC refinement. And this, this uh, I, I have absolutely no intuition if this could be true or not. Uh, I think this is a, I think this is an interesting question. You know? like, I would be curious to know 
even, even you know, on, on some example, it would be great to know. So yeah, I, I, I don't know of uh, EPCs that appear naturally in, in other branches of topology. Um, I would be really, I would love to hear, to, to, to see. I would be really interested, but I don't know. Well, thank you very much for the answers. They're really fascinating. And thanks for the talk on the organization. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, Garrick, your turn. Uh, hi. Uh, the camera doesn't work as oh, so often. Uh, it's OK. I'm not that interesting looking. Thank you so much for the presentation. Really uh, fascinating. I learned a lot, and I know almost nothing. So this is uh, perfect for me. Uh, I'm so I I know a little bit about symplectic geometry because I do a lot of things in mechanics, mechanical mm -hmm. problems, um, and the main issue that I'm sort of dealing with are usually singularities. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my question, in a way, relates to that. In that, on this slide, you you, you show this difference between the BB and the CC case, and you said A captures the area of that. Um, trapped no. loop at immersion, yeah. yes. yes. So this picture is, is great for my question because I, on the right, I could actually think of two examples, one being what you have and the other one being sort of a self loop, if you will. Right? So it crosses over itself and then it has a, a, yes. a, a loop that returns on itself. And if I think about deforming that to try to uh, resolve the crossing in the case that you show, maybe I have just a touching point and then uh, then I go over to the zero zero case, whereas if it's an intersection, I might actually go through some sort of cusp situation. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's at all relevant in this context, or if your um, your argument would actually show the difference between the two resolutions. Um, I don't know if I make any sense, but that's roughly my question. I think that uh, what what is possible probably to do. I think I, I kind of know how to do it. And we is this number A that appears here. So uh, there is another way also to think about it. It is also what we would usually call the Hofer energy that is needed to move from S to Q. Mm. So you see, when you are doing Hamiltonian uh, isotopies or exact isotopies for Lagrangian sum manifolds, there is a, a metric that shows up. So you can think of it as, as a path of immersions that start with S and end up with an embedding Q. And this path uh, can be assigned to some distance that uh, was defined by Helmut Hofer a long time ago. And of course, you can try to infamize this path and this leads to some metric. And I think that this number A that appears here and is also this area of the loon is gonna bound from below the Hofer distance, the Hofer energy needed to move from S to Q. But this I'm pretty sure. Um, which is interesting that K theory knows such a thing. I think it's conceptually interesting. But this will not tell you what is the most efficient way to do it. It will just tell you what is the length of the most efficient way. And I actually don't know if going through a cusp uh, or just going through a tangency here, what would be more economical? I really don't know. Uh, interesting question. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, super interesting. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yep. <clears throat> okay. So do we have uh, more questions from uh, for Paul? Um, okay, so in that case, thank you very much, Paul. So I'm sure. going to pause the recording here, and if anyone wants to question, uh, ask questions offline, feel free to uh, do so. Um,